from Global Design Practice Hassel. This is Hassel Talks. I'm Caroline Stalker and I'm an architect, urbanist and a principal at Hassel. I'm here on Jagera and Turrbal country in Brisbane and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I'm delighted to be stepping back into the hosting hot seat. In this episode, we'll be sharing more insights with you into how we're looking at the opportunities for Brisbane ahead of the 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games. In the previous Olympics episode, season five, episode one, do go back and have a listen if you haven't had a chance to already. We talked about public realm as the glue for a better city. This time around, we're specifically interested in precincts and what we can learn from others faced with similar large events to catalyse wider positive urban change. These episodes are case studies in a way into the types of conversations and thoughts we have as designers when we're presented with great big exciting challenges and opportunities to make places better for people. To give you the context, I'll start with a little recap so you know what's at play. In 2032, an area known as South East Queensland will host the Summer Olympics. That area is about 200 kilometres long and covers the Gold Coast, Brisbane and Sunshine Coast. There's a significant cluster of venues within Brisbane City itself and then there's other venues distributed through our 200 kilometre linear region. And of course, the Olympic venues themselves will catalyse change in the precincts around them. Each of the events in these locations throughout South East Queensland and in the cluster in central Brisbane will catalyse precinct change and renewal around the venues. So how do you get all the pieces to coordinate to guarantee all of those benefits the state wants to see? And how can we help the decision makers to see where those exciting opportunities are? Can we embrace doing what's hard to drive positive urban change? I declare open the Games of London, celebrating the 30th Olympiad of the modern era. London did. The London Olympics is known for its success in catalysing the renewal of a significant urban precinct. And while it was a slightly different format from the Brisbane Olympics, talking about it and exploring what happened in the London Olympic Games and host games development may help us to understand potential mechanisms for our own Olympics, precincts and legacy in Brisbane. Which brings me to my guests. From 2003, Andrew Comer led a team providing the strategic engineering inputs of the London 2012 Olympic Park and Legacy Master Plan and Design for Engineering and Design Consultancy Bureau Happold. Andrew worked directly for the London Development Agency and Olympic Delivery Authority with the EDOR Consortium. This award-winning scheme was the catalyst for change for the East End of London, delivering a future-proofed 246-hectare regeneration development platform from one of Europe's most deprived and polluted sites. I can't imagine anyone more perfectly placed to share his insights from that experience with us. So welcome, Andrew. Caroline, thank you very much indeed for that uh, that, uh, welcome. it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to the uh, the conversation with you and uh, with my friend and uh, and and longtime ally in uh, planning and design, Ashley. And speaking of perfectly placed experiences, my Hassel colleague Ashley Monday is also joining us today. Based in London, Ashley has worked in architecture and urban design from Australia and Asia to the Middle East and Europe. His extensive experience includes the design of entire city master plans and was also involved from the beginning of the London Games on the renewal and delivery of the East End precinct. And as you'll hear from his Antipodean accent, he's a local, born in South East Queensland. Welcome, Ash. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> Thanks, for <Caroline. laughs> Andrew, when you look back at the amazing change that took place in East London to that precinct and the urban fabric and the communities that make up the many hubs within it, what do you think the greatest lesson was? What can we learn? Well, I, the first thing I'd say is this is probably a once in a two or three generational opportunity for a country to 
to to get together um to reflect on its past and its culture to to celebrate i guess what it stands for at present but also give some real thought to where it wants to go and what it wants to be over the next 30 40 50 years you know society is changing a lot faced with a lot of pressures um across the globe climate change is you know is is something that's going to keep pace in over that over that time and uh, um, now we have the interesting dynamic of artificial intelligence and technology so there's a the whole bunch of social and societal changes on top of some of the issues mm. and stresses that any society faces any of so i think i think it's a it's a time to set step back really reflect on where the country wants to go uh, where the people want to go um and an opportunity big opportunity you know to undertake a catalytic you know sort of uh, injection of of a change of pace and direction if if that's what's required um, from your point of view, was there a single defining moment where that coalesced <laughs> what you're just describing the with the London renewal? Yeah, I think so. And it was it, and it happened very, very early on. Um, I can remember um, in 2003. So we're going back two decades now, um, seven, uh, what would that be, um, nine years out from when the Games was actually run. But the, the London authorities organised a competition uh, for consortia to to bid for the right to undertake the master planning and the planning application for the Olympic Park precinct in in East London. And I can remember having that, you know, being involved in those team meetings and the decision taken very early on that actually this wasn't about the and it wasn't necessarily just about the Olympic Games. In fact, what the most important point was going to be about the leg what was what was the legacy? What was the defining legacy of this opportunity? And so there was a from that moment on, I think everyone really, it was a light bulb moment. Everyone focused around that opportunity that, uh, to, to, to give some thought to what this place could be like in 2040. Interesting, you know, another 15 yep. years off still. Um, yep. And that the Games itself was a, an important temporal event that was, you know, an, on a journey of, over, that, over those three or four or five decades. Um, mm. So, and, and I think that was probably the winning strategy in terms of, yeah. Of, of the consortia that were pitching for the project and it and it yeah. remains very much embedded in the in the uh, program itself. Ash um, I'd like to uh, bring you into the conversation mm-hmm. you've shared a story um, about your time in London that illustrates <clears throat> the conversations that were taking place at the time mm-hmm. um, about why the decision was made to choose that really difficult site. Would mm-hmm. you mind sharing that story with us now? Yeah, yeah, sure. And th- this is almost uh, to refer to Andrew's uh, light bulb moment back in sort of mm. 2003. This is almost the, the, the mini pre light bulb moment. I was um, <laughs> an awful lot younger. I was I was a junior uh, a junior sort of associate level member on as part of a much bigger team with with Andrew and his colleagues and all sorts of other people from other companies, but I was really privileged and lucky to sort of be in the corner of the room on many occasions, taking notes uh, on behalf of much more senior colleagues. But I, there was this fantastic moment, which was about if London was to stage the Olympic Games, and at that time, nobody actually believed that we would. It was sort of like, you know, in theory, a kind of trial run, you know, Paris is probably going to win it, but let's, let's, just, let's just play this one out and see where it goes. London was to host the Olympic Games. Where should we have it? Where should we put the, you know, the middle of this Olympic site? Um, and at the time, obviously, the whole Wembley discussion was boiling away, and you had uh, Sir Norman Foster and Populous working on the beginnings of Wembley. And Wembley was a there was a big discussion about you know, where how to incorporate the athletics track into Wembley. I think every, every, anyone in the construction industry in the UK would remember that conversa- sort of mad conversation that always happens with Olympic stadiums um, about the kind of rub between the different sports that would happen there. So it's all about the, the running track and almost assumed as a fait accompli that the Olympics, if we did, of course you would have it at Wembley because you've got a stadium and you can put a track on it and we're doing a master plan around the edges. So part of that could be a village and we could get lots of other stuff. So it was almost in a way, and, you know, the, almost a no-brainer. That, that That's the way it was being perceived. And there was this a whole round of discussions where they brought in lots of design professionals from all over um, the UK, where where a group said, well, hang on a minute, and this probably kind of included my boss at the time, a really a great guy called Bob Allies, and and he sort of he and some other people, uh, Jason Pry was another one, I think, and Bill Hanway said, oh, well, hang on a minute. Well, 
that doesn't get you anything long term. You get a okay, you get a shiny new stadium, which you're getting anywhere, anyway, and you're getting a master plan around the stadium, you're getting that anyway. Um, how can we use this better? Where 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 is London a mess? Where can we We've got to grow this city. We've, we're, we're bursting at the seams. We need more transport infrastructure. We need more more land to build housing on. You know, this is we've got a housing crisis today. We've all, always had a housing crisis in London to a degree. And they said, we've got to open up development to the east of the city because there's just nothing happening out there. And they use the Olympic Games. They made this decision to use the Olympic Games on this site in the Lower Lee Valley to say, well, if we don't do it now and use this political will, and funding at, for very boring infrastructural stuff like burying power lines and remediating sites, we'll never have another opportunity in our lifetimes to open up this site and it will remain a blight on the edge of London for the next hundred years and we won't move on and develop it further. So the the bold move to, for me to do not what was easiest but was hardest, what's well, actually hard and very difficult and expensive, is now paying itself back in spades i think to the city of london not just on that olympic site but all those all those parts of london between the city and and well east beyond that olympic site are really now starting to flourish because of that decision if the people around the table did what was easiest that would still be a dead zone of the city now there's a bold uh, move and and just to and just to add to that I, ashley's absolutely right as part of the original master planning for the park and the legacy we actually undertook a study on behalf of the client to look at well what happens if London it was almost when London doesn't win the Olympics um, what can we what could we actually do in this part of London mm. and it was very little point, actually it was mm. very little mm. and it was took it was going to take an awfully long time so you know it, it was a bold move but it was that once in a lifetime opportunity to do something when you looked at the site did it seem impossible yeah I, I remember going down there and did you just you know, think, oh my God, this is well, huge? It was How are we derelict, ever going to do it? <laughs> derelict. It wasn't. It wasn't the size of it. It was the the state of it. Derelict canals, shopping trolleys, a few sheds. You know where where Europe's, you bury Europe's largest user refrigerator mountain. Yeah, I remember that very attractive. <laughs> um, Sorry, that's but you know, it's where it's where it's what happens where you go to disassemble cars you've stolen and bury bodies and stuff. That was the nature of that. Mm. that site in London, and you thought. What an impossible! How, how is this going to ever happen? In, in you know, what was it? By the time they we got on with that, you know, seven eight years away. How's how are we going to get through this? It was pretty amazing. But it, for me, it was a lesson in how you can you have to imagine and think well beyond not the constraints but the possibilities. Like you really have yeah. to throw the throw the ball way out there to imagine that, the ability to transform a place like that. And it's so been. It's, Sorry. It's been, I wouldn't even say it's been done, it's still going. And there's, yeah. there's still it's a lot of cooking to go, but it's pretty so amazing. So is that, is that speaking to the role of vision and, you know, design vision and just a driving vision that people come together around? I think I think it is. Is that the right word? It needs, yeah. Vision is really important, but there's another really important aspect to it, and I would say it's leadership. Mm. It needs yeah. It needs really strong joined up leadership at, at central, regional and local levels. You can't mm. do it otherwise, you know, yeah. because mm. there are going to be times, as there was on in London, there were times when it was, you know, there was some really rocky moments. I remember when the recession hit 2008, they'd, all, they'd <laughs> just, announced, just announced that the budget for the games had, had gone up from, you know, two and a half billion, which was always undercooked, to nine billion. And then lo and behold, Lehman Brothers collapsed and that, you know, everyone was going, Oh, you know, this is how on earth are we going to get through it? So you need you need at the very top some very strong leadership and very committed leadership. That's for sure. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I agree, and I think these these things actually, you know, it, it's division. Vision is like a it's a very a thing we use often you know, mm. around design, mm. and it really wasn't about design. Actually, it was just mm. strange mm. coming from a, an architect and an urbanist. It was about that leadership, and 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 about an idea or a possibility that transcended economies, budgets, money, politics. It was it was a very bold decision for a government to make. And you know, yeah. as Andrew said, when the, when a budget goes from two billion to nine billion, at the when the the world economy is falling off a falling off a cliff, um, that was even more difficult. But actually, it wasn't about the nine billion. The nine billion is already paying itself back. 
mm-hmm. it was it was about the possibility for London for the future or or probably a lot of stagnation for London. I mean, I think just reflecting on that, it was in a way the, the recession was quite an interesting moment of reset because suddenly governments were talking about bank losses of 50 billion or 60 billion and suddenly 9 billion <laughs> didn't seem too, but too big a step. <laughs> what a bargain. I, I want to um, talk a little bit about Brisbane and and some of the specific context of Brisbane and things that we can learn. And I think those, mes- mm. you know, the things that you've already said are hugely important. We do have a, a different format, as I mentioned earlier. We don't have an Olympic park, but we do have some critical mass around some precincts. And I guess when you mentioned the kind of the challenges of that East London precinct and there are some definitely some parallels southeast queensland like so many parts of australia and other parts of the world is facing a massive housing affordability challenge massive um, we are feeling the impacts of climate change and flooding and heat our city is becoming less equitable people have less it's harder to have the same equity of access through good transport to economic opportunities and frankly, some of the ven- venues in in the inner city are in traffic islands or things fragmented by linear infrastructure. They're in tough settings, you know, tough settings to imagine being full of high quality urban spaces around them. So I'm very interested then about how we can start to attack some of those problems to maximise uh, the uplift of those precincts for public benefit. It's a really good question. Um, I'm not at all familiar with South East Queensland, other than I'm in a lot of uh, ex-colleagues and 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 hopefully friends still who, who who live in that part of the world and who've who have had conversations with. But you know, drawing on on some of the lessons from London, I think you can go right back to some fairly basic fundamentals. And and your your point about access and movement is critical to any city to in terms of its you know in helping with its economic and social successes. Uh, because of the challenges, you know, that that I think there was perceived issues around how do you get people into and out of East London. Um, we were quite fortunate at the time because there was already a large in, amount of investment going in in terms of taking the uh, the uh, Channel Tunnel from, from Paris, rerouting it through North London and Stratford and then on to central London. So there's a big bit of a huge bit of infrastructure kit already being planned and, and budgeted for. Then layering on all those all those other modes that were going to be needed to make sure not only you get, you're able to get people to and from the park and the precinct, um, but to continue to allow London to operate smoothly. You know, because the last thing you want to do is spend have c- celebrate for six weeks with the whole city shut down and and you know new, the the economic you know, benefits being drained away um, because you can't actually get people in and out of work during the same time. So there was there was that, and then on top of that, obviously thinking about how that transport, as 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 you said uh, uh, earlier, opened up the opportunity for the the future development. So I think tr- for me. Getting that transport planning program in the operation side of it was hugely complex, and um, and I would say uh, you know a lot of it was down to the leadership again of a you know one or two really key people, Hugh Sumner, who was the mm. Olympic Development Authority's transport director for the entire journey, which was the first time anyone succeeded in that. Um, you know that was a, a significant issue to 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 deal with and get right. Yeah, I think also the other other bit of thinking, which I thought was really interesting at the beginning of that, it was sort of what I call a bit of outside in and inside out kind of thinking where you get with an Olympic Games or any big sporting event for that matter, people tend to put the venues at the centre of the planet and say it's about the venue and we work our way yeah. out from that. And, you yeah. know, it's, it's obvious, you know, because it's a big risk item. We've got to deliver these venues for the Games. But actually, I remember a lot of the early thinking on London, or the early exercises, which was about master planning the legacy and telling, almost putting an onus or a brief back on the venue about its obligations and responsibilities to the legacy, whether mm. that venue mm. stayed or not, whether it's permanent or temporary, mm. what mm. it was going to do or how the place it sat was going to perform in legacy mode and then reverse engineering it, then designing the, the venue yep. to make the contribution. So that was one bit, which was, which, was, which was about the site. The other bit was thinking about the Olympic site not as a, and we've touched on this before, not as this shiny curated master plan of 256 hectares in East London, but just thinking of it as a connection. How can we make it easier to go from 
you know, Hackney through to another part of Stratford or Tower Hamlets or wherever beyond mm. beyond the beyond the Olympic site. It was a place to pass through, which yep. sounds terrible when you you know um, when you put it to a commercial person because they go, oh, I want to capture my market and bomb yeah, a lot yeah. of retail there. But but it's not an a, island. Mm. It's not an island. It had fractured edges and mm. um, you know the. I think I've said before, the success of the Olympic site in London is not knowing where the master plan begins or finishes yes, in the end of the day. that's a um, great observation. Mm. Yeah, and, no, you know, I, I, I there's think a lot I of think... bad master plans that put the, you know, shiny new yes. here and everybody yep. else there. Well, if you've got yep. the money, you can come in. If not, off, yep. your, off your pop. Um, mm. and, and I was going to say, you know, thinking back to your initial point, it was a unique project in terms of the, the way it was approached in terms of uh, planning and design. I think it's the, the only one I've ever worked on where there were, for every, every every facet had two drawings, two sets of design that they that were worked on side by side, one looking yeah. at the legacy, one looking at the at the at the, um, at the games themselves. Yeah. And the and the mantra was, you know, we've got a budget here and we need to spend it wisely. So, you know, it was Every, I think it was every eighty-five pence or every you know, ninety pence in the pound needed to have a value in the leg in the legacy. Mm. So it it was a good, dis, really good discipline, and uh, yeah, just took, needed some smart people to make sure it worked properly. It's funny. It was yeah. It, you know, everyone objectifies the Olympic Games, but this is this whole thing was about hijacking the games for the benefit yeah. of the greater good, and it, and that was a great trajectory to start with. Um, so I'd love to take the conversation then towards how it was done and how it was procured. I mean, you, any big complex precinct has lots of different stakeholders um, across different levels of government. There's a raft of quite a lot of complexity around funding, around getting people to act together <laughs> and um, unite them around common objectives. I'm really interested in having a chat about how how that came together in London. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. It, 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 this is not going to be any different in, in South East Queensland. No one should underestimate the number of stakeholders that are going to be involved. It's absolutely enormous. Any single topic will attract dozens if not if not yeah. you know of, of of different groups they'll cut they'll, yeah needed they'll, they'll, needed yeah. and unneeded <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and uh so there is an awful lot of an awful lot of praise a lot a lot of time that needs to be spent almost behind the scenes aligning these individual you know individuals and groups trying to get them working to a common purpose in different set in different areas you know whether it's whether it's transport operations you know you can imagine in london all the taxi drivers, all the uh, train operating companies, all the bus fleets, as well as all the people, you know, the the, 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 the people who are using cars and bikes. And it, it so just, you know, that one topic alone, it, you know, needs needs a, some real thought and and uh, and and some very, very um, clever um, people who, who've got skills that, that can that can bring those sort of uh, constituencies together. So. I definitely wouldn't underestimate it. It will be. It's going to be yeah. a, a big, big challenge. Well, I, I think there was a great clarity in the end of the day. You had the Olympic Delivery Authority and you had the London Development Agency, and effectively they overlap, but then one handed over the other at the end of the London Development Agency, or a version of. Um, it's still running with it, really, with that Olympic site still moving oh, yeah. along. Yeah, London, London Legacy Development Company. That's it. Yeah. You had that entity, and it was really again comes down to leadership. It was actually pretty well led with some very, yeah. very good people. You didn't have um, a bunch of local authorities, and then um, I know a city, a wider city authority or a federal authority, sort of duking it out to see if you get influence oversight. You, you had a clear fulcrum in that in that client for moving the project, the legacy of the project forward. And you know, it, it's always had its moments because it's just tough and it's big and it's complicated. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. That clear coalescing of a piece of responsibility and leadership, I think, has made this more more possible and better. And, uh, and yeah, interestingly, I learned only yesterday that it's in its run, it is pretty much into its final year. So it was set up, I think, started, oh, started running from 2013, 2012, probably just after the games finished. Mm. It's cut its, its life, it had a determined life. And now all of the, the the responsibilities that it took on planning mainly as a planning authority 
they, that comes to an end and uh, all the all the responsibilities are handed back to yeah. local boroughs in yeah, next that, year some next year planning and development so yeah. so as in um, development facilitation but not operation yeah, they, of any they, of the public spaces but I, all no. of it they, yeah. they, no well they they, they retained okay. ownership of, of a number of um, of public areas um, they worked in partnership you know they were they 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 partnered with private sector to develop out some of the um, uh, development mm -hmm. platforms mm -hmm. um, so that they shared you know part of the, the whole part of the thinking was that um, the public sector recovered some of the or as much of the original investment and more in the, in the future success of the park so they continued you know there's that ongoing public in involvement um, with with the future of the park um, uh, and the development platforms all the way through to, as I say, next year. Yeah, and I, I think that's really interesting in itself, actually, because it was it was done yes, with a view is, not yeah. to not to be an estates management entity in the end of the no. day and keep going. Yeah. It was done to coalesce and clarify decision making, but also be that entity that would overlap with the constituent boroughs that make up, surround, and impact on that. Yep sort of impinge on that Olympic site and eventually hand it over to them. So it becomes, and again, it sounds like the most normal, boring thing in the world, but it becomes a normal piece of the city and each borough. It gets handed over. The borough yep. has something they can manage yep. just like the existing stuff next door. Yep. And it's about it's about the beauty of normalisation, I think. Yeah, with, it just settles stuff, not, back into the city. Exactly. Yeah, mm, yeah, that's very nice. The thing about the Olympic site in London, you know, it wasn't pretty at the start, but that didn't matter. And London's a great, a great city for the dealing that deals with things that are kind of beyond beauty. It wasn't about mm -hmm. this is beautiful, we should keep it, or we should make it more beautiful. It was about mm -hmm. this is interesting or this is part of our history or this is part of our mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. Let's make mm -hmm. sure we don't we don't lose this. And I would, you know, if I think around, you know, the the Gabba in Brisbane, for example, mm -hmm. where there's going to be a lot of activity, um, that's an old, you know, the Gabba, Kangaroo Point, down to the yep. cliffs and the views of the city and down to the river and all that kind of stuff. And that's a really important part of the city of Brisbane. It has it a is, history yeah. to it and it has a there's a lot of people that love that part of the city dearly. And there's a thing mm. that says to me, you know, a first point, let's not lose what we've got. Let's not let's make sure we're really clear about what makes this part of Brisbane special and unique. Yeah. Let's make sure we keep that and then use it as a use it as a kind of not as a constraint, but an opportunity to push to rub against to develop either Olympic olympic venues olympic works and then the legacy beyond that but it's got yeah. to start with what's it's sort of trying to very clearly connect history to the future and not not for me wipe wipe make a clean slate and then make something that's shiny and new that's not that's not how cities really should evolve um that's where cities start to lose their soul actually you start doing that and there's many examples of that around the world and there's no there's no need for brisbane to do that it's got plenty to offer and plenty to keep yeah i i, I I would fully endorse that, and and you know, looking thinking about London, what how did London, you know, materially ben or how did the UK materially benefit um, from the games? I mean, apart from great celebration, you know, I think I think the there's a huge synergy in term built or, or similarity, I should say, between the UK and Australia, and my you know, both both sport, sports loving sportsman uh, nations, which. You know, whatever happens, it'll be a success, I'm sure, in 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 in, in Brisbane because of that can-do attitude and and just the love of sport that that you the, the the country has. But I think, you know, there's some there were some fairly, I guess, less well advertised benefits that were were, were seen in in the UK. You know, there was a a big change in attitude in construction industry, which is notorious in terms of the way. It, it um, has has failed to really keep pace with modernization over the last 50, 50 or 60 years. So some big commitments to much more sustainable processes in, in design and construction, which was really positive. A step change I was suggesting in inclusive design, that was a big body of work that was, you know, London committed, Sebastian Co, Lord, Lord Coe, I should say, being, being hit rather more formally, he committed it to this being the most accessible games ever. And and there was a lot of work done to make sure it was. Mm. Um, a lot of work done on, on health and well-being. You know, the park itself, one of the first, in fact, the first big London park for, for a century, I think, that was constructed, mm. you know, to give more open space to people and the movement and access we've already talked about. I think, you know, Brisbane, South East Queensland will have its own 
challenges in the country and in terms of some of and those sorts do. of yeah, yeah. Uh, but but mm. I think what on top of that I would go back to some of those you know, the two bit for me the two big challenges that that everyone faces climate change and you know it's already we you, you, we know the sort of it we've seen on the news the impacts that's happening in in your part of the world um so that's a big big serious issue to make sure is being addressed under underlying underlying the development of the of, of the games and ai and technology the way the way the olympics itself as an event is transmitted and enjoyed by billions of people across the globe is going to be totally different to the way london was and the way Bra- yeah. you know rio was it's tra- technology going to transform how we see view and enjoy um, these sorts of sporting events also at the same time is a big game changer in terms of employment opportunity you know that it certainly i know uh, australia is focusing a lot on its on its new tech industries and this is a big opportunity to start to embed mm. technology mm. ai into the fabric of, of of southeast queensland what i've heard and what we've discussed and the things that i think we can uh, that might help us think about our own precincts um, around our venues um, First of all, I loved what you said about understanding the gravity of the moment, (laughs) as in the hugeness of the opportunity and a kind of a collective determination to make the best of it. Uh, I think that sort of fundamental starting point is really important. But you've also spoken and referred to several times throughout this conversation about the critical role of strong leadership around a bold idea underpinned by long-term thinking. I mean, we could use the word vision, but we've, you've really talked about boldness in, in setting, setting the course and sticking with it and bringing, bringing people together around it. So a certain amount of political will and leadership seems to be incredibly, an incredibly important, important part of what was delivered there and the ability to help coordinate the efforts of the different levels of government valuing the legacy and I hadn't been aware that there was a legacy development authority um, for after the game so having the you know the the wherewithal to make sure that that promise is really delivered on over the longer time and then you also ma- mentioned valuing the intrinsic qualities of what makes the city unique and making sure that gets built in and that you're not making something separate that you're making something that's very meshed into its setting and makes that setting um, more accessible and uh, improves the quality of of the areas outside of that setting as well. So I think there's some incredibly helpful thoughts there, things that we can take forward as we go further into this design and planning phase of the Brisbane 32 Olympic and Paralympic Games. So thank you to our guests, Andrew Homer and Ashley Mundy for their time. Caroline, thank you very much indeed. And thank you to our listeners. We know you're as passionate about the role design plays in creating a beautiful, resilient and inclusive future as we are. And thank you, Prue Vincent and Michelle Bailey, who produced this episode. I'm Caroline Stalker. You've been listening to an episode of Hassle Talks. 